Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Folks, today is Wednesday, number 15th, 2023, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Many people, uh, yours included, was shocked and stunned when then Houston Rockets star Kevin Porter Jr. was arrested uh, in a New York hotel. The, the, what was described was a vicious physical assault against and WNBA player. Well, in exclusive, uh, she will join us to talk about what happened on September 11th, what were the actual details, and what is going on in this case uh, that uh, has left many people perplexed. He no longer is in the NBA, uh, and so the question is, what really happened? We will talk about this uh, with uh, Kiers Gondrasek about this very thing. So this is an exclusive interview. You don't want to miss that. Also, folks, Louisiana has this runoff on Saturday. There are several Democrats uh, who are running. Advocate Gary Chambers will be here to discuss what needs to happen. Will we see black folks turn out after the abysmal showing in the uh, primary election just last month? Also, Arkansas Senator Tom Scott had the audacity, the unmitigated gall to criticize the Biden administration and calling uh, them wrong for trying to ban menthol cigarette, cigarettes and disproportionately impact African-Americans. 
Tom Cotton don't like black people. So I'm gonna tell you why he's shameful for now trying to so-called stick up for black folks. And also a Republican Pennsylvania superintendent resigns after his party loses control of the school board. But his friends make sure he gets a huge severance package that's gonna cost thousands of dollars uh, for taxpayers. Folks, uh, and <laughs> uh, a Republican in Congress blasts his party saying, we've done nothing for our constituents. Well, I agree. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's, whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. September 11th of this year, NBA star Kevin Porter Jr. was uh, handcuffed, arrested uh, for a vicious, vicious physical assault against a woman in a New York hotel room. Details comes out. People were very shocked to hear. We heard that it was a, a cracked vertebrae, that uh, she was abused. Uh, Kaiser Gondrzek uh, is uh, that WNBA player. When the story went out, the Houston Rockets immediately uh, suspended any contact with him, later traded to the Oklahoma uh, basketball team. They cut him. He's not in the NBA. Case is going forward. Uh, and so when we hear uh, these particular details uh, of this case, uh, people say, oh, my God, how dare uh, a man do this? Uh, how can he, you have uh, a woman you're involved with uh, who's, a, who's a fellow athlete who's a gorgeous woman, what the heck w w were you thinking? But what really happened? Well, Kaiser Gondrzek joins us right now uh, in this exclusive interview to talk about this uh, because she has some concerns with regard to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And so, uh, first and foremost, uh, glad to have you here. Uh, your folks reached out uh, to me on social media, uh, and we begin to look into this, and I said, well, let's definitely have this conversation. Uh, so, uh, first off, as, as I look at what happened, first of all, uh, Kevin Porter Jr. was initially charged with assault in the second degree, strangulation in the second degree, assault in the third degree, and since then, the assault in the second degree charge was dropped. And so, uh, there clearly is a whole lot uh, to unpack here. Uh, so, uh, so, so first and foremost, and I'm, I'm just going to methodically go through this. I was going through your social media page. I think it was in February. Uh, you had posted about y'all been together for one year. Uh, when, on, on September 11th, were the two of you still together? Were you, were you dating? Were you, were you still involved in a relationship in September? Yes, we were. Okay. Uh, and so uh, what happened? Uh, the affidavit shows uh, an incident that took place in the morning, uh, around 6 a.m. that morning. Uh, I'm going to read from some of that in a little bit, but from your perspective, what happened? Were you physically assaulted by Kevin Porter Jr. in a New York hotel room? Do I feel as if that he intentionally tried to cause me great harm? Um, no. I do not believe that at all. What does that, However, mean, what, what does that mean when you say, do I feel that he was not trying to intentionally cause me great harm? Did the two of you have an argument? What, first of all, were you still awake? Did you wake up? I mean, 6 o'clock in the morning is, is early, so set for me the scene of what happened that led to this altercation. Yeah, I don't believe that I was physically assaulted. Um, I had, we were in New York, um, uh, attending New York Fashion Week. Um, just earlier that night, we had just finished attending a fashion show. I had some meetings early the next morning to attend to, so I decided to call it an early night. He uh, stayed out with his friends, his teammates, 
and obviously came back at a later time. Um, me being asleep, I was unaware of the fact that he was locked out of the room. Um, security, to my understanding, helped let him in. Um, and I was awakened to, you know, just yelling and, and him being very adamant about wanting to have a conversation with me that even still to this day, I don't even know what that was, you know, about. Um, I was, you know, very hazy, you know, um, being awakened from sleeping. And I could smell, you know, a hue of alcohol. Um, clearly, it wasn't the right space nor the right time frame to even have a conversation. Um, and as, you know, he grabbed me by my shoulders to try to wake me up to have that, you know, I stand up, you know, very quickly on the bed and I fall off the side of the bed and hit the side of my eye on the wall. Um, and that's where the laceration above my eye came from. There was a makeup uh, splat and um, a little blood splat on the wall to, to justify and support that injury. I don't know if you've ever tried to stand up um, on a bed. Uh, there's actually no support. Um, the, there is so much imbalance that I fell. And in hindsight of that, I noticed blood. And to be completely honest, I I was in shock. I I kind of like just, I don't know, I kind of panicked and I ran out the room. Um, and once when I ran out the room, the security officer that had let him in was still standing at the elevator. So it just goes to show you how fast and, and such a blur the whole incident, you know, happened that the guy that let him in was still standing outside waiting to go down. And to my understanding, that's when they escorted me down and, and, and I heard that he was arrested. Um, I'm looking at the uh, signed complaint. Go to my iPad, please. Uh, it says, um, the factual basis for these charges are as follows. I am informed by a person known to the district attorney's office, informant one, that she observed the defendant strike her repeatedly about the face with a closed fist, causing a laceration above her right eye and bruising and substantial pain to her face. I am further informed by informant one that she observed the defendant use his hands to apply pressure to her neck by forcefully squeezing it, causing her to experience difficulty breathing, redness and bruising to her neck and substantial pain. One, when they say informant one, is that you? No. It is in a recording from the supervisor acknowledging that the criminal complaint that you're reading and that was filled out was from what officers believed they thought happened at the time. And I have her saying that word for word and apologizing to me for putting out fact and uh, non-factual information uh, that uh, was not valid to my truth. So hold on one second. So... Again, this is a signed complaint um, by, go back to my iPad, because uh, it, it, it says the people of the state of New York against Brian uh, Porter. This is a sworn statement from police officer Patrick Amato. And it says, false statements made in this written instrument are punishable as a Class A misdemeanor pursuant to Section 214.45 of the penal law and as other crimes. So you are saying that what is stated in this uh, signed complaint by a New York police officer, that you did not say any of these things to the police officer. No, the criminal complaint was filled off, uh, filled out what officers believed to happen at the time and by hearsay um, regarding evidence uh, that they heard medical personnel talking about what my injuries were that was inaccurate. So we're talking, but again, as I read this here, when, some, when, when, when a statement says that she observed the defendant strike her repeatedly about the face with a closed fist, uh, and then that pressure was applied to her neck by forcefully squeezing it, causing her to experience difficult breathing. So you're saying Kevin Porter Jr. never hit you in the face with a closed fist? No, he never bought his fist up and hit me in the face numerous times, nor did he ever strangle me. Uh, to the point where there was lacerations around my neck or where he fractured my spine and my neck. Those allegations are not true. Okay. Um, uh, and you did supply us. You had a conversation with the district attorney's office. Uh, folks, cue that up, uh, where, as you said, they, they told you that they apologized for these details being made public. Go, guys, go ahead and play that. Information that was... was, was was conveyed earlier in, in, at the arraignment that mm -hmm. no one had any 
uh, consent or anything in writing from her as she's just kind of processing all of this and you're still releasing stuff, information? That she oh, I- has not given a document, no statement or anything, but you're just att- attaching all of this for a storyline? Well, first of all, I completely hear you. This must be so overwhelming to see in the press what we're saying and you're not getting as much information from us as we would like you to get. So I'm so sorry about how this Oh is no, no this is so this isn't about us getting information about what you all have and you all releasing information to us. It's about information that you're releasing that Kaiser has not given a voice to. She has not given you a statement. She has not given you any consent to release any of her records, any of her information with her her, her physical status or any injuries that you sat there and said, oh, I'm sorry for, because in order to what, to make you all's case for, 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 for today, for court, for the arraignment, that you made those statements? And she didn't give you permission to do that. And so it's still more, it's still coming out. So just five well, minutes I, ago, there's more coming out that your voice me, is attached to? Let me first of all say, we have not released any statements to the press. What's being quoted is what I said in court this morning. We are not speaking or releasing anything. And like I said to you say, earlier, when you said what you said, the quotes that came from the arraignment this morning, you said you 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 made those statements in order to give the what the enforcement to the the, the charges that you all were filing so against, all, against uh, Mr. Porter. She did not give you that. She did not give you that information. She did not tell you that information. It is a further violation for you to turn around and release her her medical information. I'm happy to explain. So, first of all, the statements that are being attributed to her in the press, that is coming from police reports and police documents. Um, The statement that I made and that is in the criminal court documents about her injuries, that is something that the police officer heard. I and would so my, whether, whether my, he heard it or not to misrepresent that, that is still her confidential information. There but you turn there. around and reiterated, you repeated it and said it for in the arraignment for the courts as if like it's something that you all were given consent to release. And that was inappropriate and that was a violation of her own personal rights for her medical history, for the sake of your of your case. Yes, so... But you couldn't wait until she no, would sit down we, to have a conversation not, with you all. We could not legally wait. We are required to file the complaints within a certain number of hours. And that so, is why and who, I'm very and who much filed wanted the complaint? to speak with you. Right, and so, so just because you weren't that. able to speak with her, who gave you authorization to what? To file the complaint on behalf of whom? We are legally required to file a complaint within a certain amount of hours. On behalf of whom? This is why. On behalf of whom? And I'm asking you a question. On behalf of whom? On behalf of the people of the state of New York. This is the job that we do. Okay, Um, on behalf of the people of the state of New York. Not all right, so there's about another three minutes of the conversation. First of all, uh, Kaiser, who, who is talking to uh, the uh, uh, the woman there? Uh, she is uh, with the um, uh, Manhattan DA's office, uh, Myra Kurzer. She's the intimate partner in Sexual Violence Bureau of the New York DA's office. So who's, who's talking to her on that audio recording? That is my mom. Okay, so your mother is talking to her. All right, um... A, a, a lot of times when, when we have these w- we, these cases, and we've seen this numerous times, whether it involves athletes, entertainers, or even just, uh, just, just regular ordinary folks, that uh, women who have been uh, victims of domestic violence often recant. You're saying here that what they describe as taking place, none of that happened. No, and I've never recanted a statement I came out publicly. Um, my attorney spoke on my behalf two days after the event um, through Baller Alert. 
um, appreciating all of the, the community's support and prayers, but to please avoid speculation for evidence and allegations that have been reported are false and misleading. I released that information two days after the event. You're... If you continue... Go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. I'm if, you're, if you continue to play the audio, she specifically verbatimly states that because she did not talk to me, she had to bring forth some information to, to bring forth the elements of the case and elements of the crime against him, meaning that she cultivated her own narrative to make some type of false information to make stick to support the charges that she was bringing against Mr. Porter. That, as you can hear her say, that she never got a chance to speak with me first. Okay, so your attorneys also, this and your, your team sent us this. Go to my iPad here. Um, where uh, y'all wanted uh, the protective order lifted because, uh, as here it says, uh, there are many things that she has to discuss with him, including finances, moving, possessions, et cetera. She would also like that her actual physical condition be revealed and that there not be any exaggeration of what happened and that any prior incorrect statements be clarified and addressed on the 16th. Uh, your attorneys offered to have a Zoom call to discuss this further. Uh, and so... I, I guess just what is, is I'm just still trying to understand. Uh, again, when I read a complaint and I see these things listed, one, the public often believes when, um, obviously, when the DA's office, p police officers release information, there are assumptions that they actually talk to the individual uh, involved. Uh, and so you're saying at no time that you actually, they, 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 that, they didn't interview you. So, so when they arrived, when the police arrived uh, on the scene, because you said when, uh, when he left, you, actually when you ran out, went down to the elevator, and you went downstairs, he was under arrest. At no time you sat down and actually talked to police, D's office, on the scene, at the precinct. Nothing was ever recorded, video or audio, nothing along those lines. They asked me at the scene as to what happened, and I told them, I don't know. Clearly, I was in distraught. I had a lot of people around me telling me what they thought happened. When I was in the hospital room, they asked me to write down a statement. They asked me to record me to give a statement. I told them that I could not give one. I didn't feel comfortable doing that. They asked me to write a statement. I asked them, I said, are you allowed to write a statement for me? They said, no, legally, we are not allowed to. But then next thing you know, I see a criminal complaint that is filled out by police officers. And I have a supervisor who called me in October and told me that the criminal complaint was filled out by what officers believed to have happened at the time, as I recorded that conversation as well. Um, how, who called the cops? How did they arrive I, at I, the scene? I, no, I don't know who called the cops. I, I didn't call the police. Um, your um, your attorneys, so so there, there's no 911 call or anything along those lines coming from the hotel or anything like that that you're aware of? I, to be honest with you, Mr. Rowland, I don't know who called. I still don't know who called the police to this day. Um, shortly after it happened, uh, your sister posted some comments uh, on Instagram. Um, did... And, and so and she was absolutely angry at, angry, angry at him uh, for what allegedly happened. Uh, did you then shortly they have to communicate with her? Uh, because that post, obviously, what she posted went viral because she was very angry at what uh, allegedly happened. Yeah, so obviously she reacted in a way that the general public did with the information that was released um, without communicating with me or my mom at the time. I hadn't even spoken with my mom either. Um, until I got back to the hotel and was able to FaceTime her to see me that I was perfectly okay. Um, so I can't penalize her for that. But once when she was able to connect with my mom and my mom was able to give her some insight that the things that were posted um, and falsely accused were not true, she removed the post. And so that's why they are no longer present. Um, uh, uh, get, there are going to be folks who are watching this, who are hearing this, who are going to say... This sounds like uh, a young lady who was involved in a relationship who is trying to protect him and his career. What do you say to folks who may believe that's the case? Yeah, this, this isn't about Kevin. This is about me. This is about the integrity of who I am, the woman that I've worked so hard to become, the name that I've worked so hard to create. 
and to not allow someone who's in a position um, to feel entitled or to feel empowered to be able to misrepresent my voice and who I am. You know, with the, the district attorney's office jumping to conclusions that I would be on the same side as their injustice, it backfired. What they saw was an African-American male. They saw a professional athlete. They saw a young woman who was in complete distraught and, 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 and speechless and, and shocked and still trying to process everything that's going around her and believe that it would be a win-win situation for both parties involved one on their end where it will catapult a career. It would make the storyline of the year. And on my end where I would be gaining some, you know, uh, some money, you know, some some type of uh, increase in, in, in value and it would be a win-win situation. But clearly they didn't do the research of who I am and who I represent. This is about my employers. This is about me making sure that I, I come forward and, and speak my truth so that this isn't about me trying to win over the general public, but in my, my workplace, my, my circle, that I'm not going to allow someone to misrepresent who I am. And I don't believe in defaming someone else's character and integrity in order to add value to my work, to put out false information, to speak on my behalf, to, to cultivate injuries that never even occurred. I am an athlete. I have dreams of my own. I've, I, 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 I played in the WNBA before I met Kevin. He came along and, 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 and helped add value to my life. But I was my own person. I am my own person. And this isn't about protecting him. This is about protecting who I am and what I stand for. And to know that this could come at the hands of those that are supposed to protect and serve, to manipulate and to falsify evidence to, to add value to their integrity and to not consider my own. It's completely defamatory, corruptive, and injustice. And that is why I'm speaking out and giving my testimony to my truth, because if they can do this to me and I'm supposed to be the victim, I can only imagine the countless of lies that they have done this to and try to cover up for. I have a word for word of emails of a, a DA telling me after I've given her information and, and, and identified the injustice, of whether or not she wants to disclose this information in a court of law. This is a crime. This is a felony. No civilian can sit up on a stand and lie. No civilian can sit up on a stand and manipulate evidence. No civilian can sit up on a stand and, and, and try to generate an own narrative to, to, to bring forth charges against someone. And to know that you have an assistant district attorney and other parties involved in the department that knew about it and did this in a court of law, this is a crime, and they should not be above the law in any type of matter to be able to bring defamatory and completely stifle someone's life and ruin their career. And I'm talking about my own, not Kevin's. Um, this is not the first time you've talked. October 18th, uh, mm -hmm. last month, uh, go to my iPad. You posted this on your Twitter page where you said... Uh, it has been deeply frustrating and disturbing by the manipulation of what was stated by the prosecution. Then you said the harassment and eagerness for me to support these claims to justify their position and remarks as a matter an assistant DA took into her own hands while I was vulnerable, emotionally healing, and unavailable at the time of information being released. Do you want to see all of the charges against Kevin Porter Jr. to be dismissed? I'm not in a position to make that. That's not my right, call. Right, right, right. You're not in a position to make that, but if you were saying that the things in which he has been charged with did not happen, if you were saying that he didn't punch you in the face repeatedly, that he did not strangle you, uh, that, none of, that, that none of those things actually happened, then he is being wrongfully charged. That, that, Absolutely. So you're saying that what they are alleging... What he's being charged with, charged with is absolutely, positively, 100% completely false. And if, if you're saying that, that means those charges should be dropped. Absolutely. That is why one of them have been dropped already. And they've already offered this man a plea deal of no jail time that they didn't report. But they have it out in the general public and to the media that he's still facing two charges. There's so much information that they're withholding because they are refusing to take accountability for their actions and manipulating this entire case to catapult their own injustice. There's, uh, and, and, and I'm not trying to compare the two, 
Um, but you have another case in the Manhattan DA's office in involving act actor Jonathan Majors. His attorneys have suggested uh, that the DA's office has been grossly unfair. NYPD wanted to arrest the woman who filed a complaint against him. The DA's office said they're not going to prosecute. Uh, I, I can't, and, and, and also look, you have a DA in Manhattan, Alvin Bragg, who's African American. Uh, and so I don't know what, what his involvement is in, you know, drilling down in these sort of in individual cases. Uh, but, but I'm sort of struck by these two cases in particular, uh, two high-profile African-Americans. Uh, their lawyers obviously doing what this, you know, their lawyers doing what they were supposed to do. But to hear you say that a complaint was filed giving the impression that you said all of these things in... A month after it happened, you say on your own Twitter account it didn't happen. Here you are now a month later, uh, it didn't happen, uh, saying it did not happen. Um, that clearly has, has, has to be angering you that the DA's office is just standing firm on this and by saying, well, we got a complaint, we have to prosecute, but you are the alleged victim who's saying it didn't happen. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm very angry. I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm shocked. You know, you never believe that things can happen to you until they happen to you, right? And so I, I try to, you know, put faith in my creator and, and giving me the peace and knowing that I was placed here um, for a reason, that there is purpose through this experience. And, and, I'm, and I'm realizing that it is to highlight the injustice of what really goes on behind closed doors in these departments and with these prosecutors. And, and for me to record and to have these informations and, and, and writing and through email and, and through phone call conversations, I never did that with the intention um, of sitting here, you know, before you today um, sharing this information. I do that for my own personal safety, but I'm, I thank God that I did because I truly believe that without this evidence that no one would believe me, given the fact that information that's supposed to come from you know, the DA's office that's supposed to come from law enforcement is supposed to be credible and factual. And to know that they can do this and withhold information and disregard information, it's, it's, it's very unsettling and it's disheartening and very disturbing. And, I'm, and, and it is, I feel like it's my duty to, to come forth and talk about it because they've tried to defame the integrity of who I am to bring forth charges against someone that never did any of these things that they have against him. And the fact that they blatantly know that, the fact that they're so arrogant and, and highlighting and apologizing to me for what they've done, but are refusing to do so to the general public. I, I, when I see information on social media, I'm just as surprised as everyone else because those aren't the conversations that we have behind closed doors with my attorney and the assistant district attorney's office. So at any point in this in all of this, have you sat down with the Manhattan DA's office and done a formal interview? And have you, let's say that same complaint, have you filed anything with them under oath, under threat of perjury, that these things did not happen? Has any of that happened? I never sat down in front of them. I did a Zoom call with them expressing to them what happened uh, a week later. That was the first time that I spoke to them. As you can see with the, the countless of phone calls and, and the emails, my attorney made them very aware that these things did not happen. Me highlighting this is a result of them dropping one of the charges. Um, and after they come to find yeah, out they, that... Yeah, they, they said that, you had, that he had fractured your vertebrae and then mm -hmm. came out and said, no, that actually didn't happen. Yeah, and the, and, and the thing about it is they knew that three weeks before they even released it. Well, first of all, how, do, was, how, how do they even arrive at fracturing a neck vertebrae? How, where, where did that even come from? Did, did... If, you, if you heard on the phone, Mr. Rowland, the information that she received was by what a police officer overheard. So she's basing this evidence based on hearsay of what a police officer was ear hustling about what my injuries were and didn't wait until my records came back to identify that that was never even okay, actual. I, okay, because I'm, I'm, again, if somebody, if, if, 
if I, again, if, if I'm, a, I'm a reporter, okay, and if I'm a journalist, and, but even if I wasn't, if I hear police say um, this woman suffered a fractured neck vertebrae, I'm instantly thinking she was checked out by paramedics, there was an X-ray, it showed that happened. You're saying there was no fracture, there was nothing along those lines, there was no X-ray, that that statement alone was based upon what a police officer heard. You, you hear her say that in the phone conversation, yes. And the, a doctor came forward to Fox News, who I don't even know who the doctor's name was, that came forth and said, it was in an article, that he was unaware of where this information came from. But the, the, the thing that they found was a congenital defect, I believed, um, in my spine, which I don't even know, between you and I, I don't even know what that is. Maybe something that I was born with. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Come... yeah t t t we've seen this in other athletes where they're born with that that's later discovered when it comes to an insurance claim or whatever, because normally y y you don't have those deeply sort of intensive physicals. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and so to hear her say that um, on the phone, that that was a result of what a police officer heard, that's when it kind of woke me up. Okay, what else have you guys falsely, you know, uh, cultivated a narrative on surrounding this case? And as the information that got released, it was on the hour. Like, new information was getting released by the hour and I had no idea where this information came from. But after a supervisor of the uh, department told me on the phone that is recorded, um, told me this in October, it is now November, that the criminal complaint was, was filled out by what officers believe they thought happened at the time, and that they apologized for the false narrative, and that they only want to move forward with the actual truth. This is a conversation they had with me that they have yet to release, and it is now almost the end of November. So, all right, go to my iPad. This right here is Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg. Um, yes. Are you and your attorneys, have you or are you requesting a meeting specifically with him regarding what you consider to be malfeasance on the part of his assistant district attorneys? To my understanding, that was actually my attorney's angle, was to reach out to Alvin Bragg at, at some point to be able to have a conversation with him about the injustice that was happening and putting forth confidence in him, given the fact that he is an African-American male. But we have yet, you know, heard a response from anyone. Um, I've also had my attorney call the supervisor, who was also who was also a former prosecutor as well, and he has yet to hear anything back from them. So it's it's very unfortunate um, to believe and to know that the people that are supposed to to protect, you know, my safety can bring forth harm and and completely be dismissive of a situation that you know was very traumatic to me. But they've added and compounded more trauma into my life than Kevin did. Um, again, there were about three different um, uh, audio calls that, uh, that that your team sent to us, uh, and, uh, and and I just want to again just show for folks. Uh, I'm not showing actual phone numbers or emails, but uh, Robert uh, Hantman or Hantman is um, your attorney. Th this is an email that is sent to the assistant DA October 15th, and. Dear Myra, thank you for your prompt response to us today. As we understand that the charges against Mr. Porter will be reduced tomorrow, it is important to our client that it be stressed that she was not responsible for the original complaint and allegations and that she not be connected to it so it doesn't look like she was the responsible she, that she was the responsible for releasing incorrect information to the general public. She suggests the following. There's some additional language. So... If we're going back, September 11th, when this all came down, it was just the two of you in a New York hotel room. Argument ensued. You, you're awakened by him. Security lets him in. You say you stood up on the bed and fell off of the bed, and that's how you cut your eye, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. You you were like, okay, look, I'm asleep. Why is this dude yelling? Why is he screaming? What the hell's going on? And so then you just run out of the hotel room, correct? Yes. You run to the elevator. The security who let him in is still at the elevator. Take it, did you and that security officer ride down? Yes. And you said, how long was it, you said, when you got down, when you got downstairs, that cops were on the scene and they were going to arrest him? I don't know. I oh, didn't find out that he was arrested until I was in the hospital. So when you went down, so when you went downstairs, you had a cut. Uh, what happened? Did someone call an ambulance and then the ambulance came and then you were taken to the hospital? Yes, which they left me and attended in the hospital for five to six hours. So you're in the hospital. At any point, is the NYPD at the hospital taking notes, talking to you? No, there was nothing for me to give them. That's when they had asked me to do a written complaint. I told them that I couldn't fill it out at the time. That's when I asked, were they allowed to do so? They said, legally, they are not allowed to do so. And then they asked me if they could do a recording of me stating what happened. I told them I didn't feel comfortable doing that. I'm still trying to process everything. And I kept begging and pleading to them, can I get my phone? Can I get some form of contact to be able to contact my family and my mom, which they left me unattended. They didn't let me know until after my discharge, oh, by the way, this is all over the media, just so you know. I asked them, I said, who released this information? They said, well, legally, we are not allowed to. I said, but you guys are the only ones that are present. Yeah, well, legally, we're not allowed to. And the first the first post that I see is Kaiser Gondrzyk was hospitalized with severe bruising and at least one broken bone. The only people that were present were the police. To reiterate, you made it clear in this interview, you are not doing this for Kevin Porter Jr. to absolve him of anything. Um, you say, you're saying this is about you. Um, one, are the two of you still together? Because in your statement, no. you, so you know, we, we go ahead. Not together. No, we're, we're not together. You're not together. Um, you haven't had any communication with him or his camp regarding any of this? No, I have not. There was also a protective order in place that didn't allow for that to happen. Is that protective order still in place? Um, it has been currently lifted as to two weeks ago. And right. there has still been no contact. Gotcha. Uh, and again, your attorneys also wanted it to be lifted so the two of you could have, or your respective camps could have discussions about uh, things, I guess, y'all had jointly, possessions, homes, all yes. things along those lines. Yes. Um, you said earlier, uh, and I was wanted to come back to you, you talked about you're doing this for your sake, your name, and things on the, and how you have been impacted. Do you believe that as a result of this story and it going national and it going international, again, the NBA, the Rockets having no contact with him, essentially being suspended, they trade him. Oklahoma City cuts him. He's not picked up by anybody. It's all over. Do you believe that this absolutely has had a negative impact on you? Uh, your WBA player, you list as actress, as model on your, on your Twitter, has this do you believe this has negatively impacted you, even though you were the alleged victim? Right, absolutely. It has created a narrative that I support what happened to me, uh, based off of the false narrative that was put out there. Um, it, it, it also, you know, degrades, you know, who, who I am, my employers, the things that I had set up. Um, before this situation happened, very big partnerships, that it now comes across that I am, you know, not integral. I'm not credible to work with. Uh, are, know, those, are those, excuse me one second, uh, Kaiser. Are those partnerships, have they been placed on hold? At everything in my life has been placed on hold because people wow. want to know what is going on and what's the truth. And all I've asked for now, two months now, to for them to take accountability for what they've done. And the fact that I have information, the fact that I came out with articles regarding since September the 12th, the incident happened on September the 11th, and it is now, I believe, November the, what, 14th, 15th, you know, that, that they still have yet to take accountability, that they're still, you know, promoting and, and falsifying information to the public in a court of law. That's the part where I'm appalled. 
you know, uh, to that they they feel arrogant enough to withhold information and not include anything that I've said. They disregarded my value. They disregarded, you know, my character and undermining that to elevate their own. This isn't about me winning over social media. I, I, I don't I don't live a life based off of other people's perception of me. I, the, who I've been and, 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 and just the career that I've had have, has, you know, forced me to become in a place where I've had to gain the wisdom and the strength to not allow other people's perceptions of me, um, let that have any value or merit to how I view myself on a daily basis. This is about me standing in my purpose. This is about the conversations that I have with God as to why am I here? Why is this being hyped up more than, than what it actually was? And to know that they could do this to someone. This isn't about Kevin I'm speaking about. To me, the victim, and, and not taking to any merit as to a situation that only happened to me. And to try to, you know, fixate that into their own narrative to bring forth charges against someone. I, I, I'm just truly appalled to be honest with you, Mr. Rowland, and I feel like it's necessary for me to come and speak my truth. You know, I'm, I'm a very strong Black woman. I haven't complained. I've taken my hits. You know, I have my, my days where I feel really empowered. You know, I feel untou untouchable. And then I have other moments where I can't even get out of bed, you know, and, and just trying to put one foot in front of the other. You know, at me being a Black woman, being raised by a Black woman, you know, I'm going to figure it out. It's going to be okay. Um, and And... I, you know, I'm not going to let any man do to me what they put out there. That's for certain. But at the same time, if it didn't happen that way, I'm not going to be silent about it either. I have a younger brother. If someone did this to him, you know, I would be very angry. I would be furious, you know, and I would tell him to do the same thing that I'm doing. Don't allow someone else in your fear of their position to keep you silent. If anything, I hope that me speaking my truth on this platform encourages others to do the same that have been wrongfully accused or have been in this situation before that don't have my resources or the platform to do so. And that's why I feel like I'm here, you know, ultimately to, to get Kaiser's life back. Not, you know, Kaiser and Kevin, Kaiser's life back. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna and I'm not gonna rest until there's justice that is served. You know, what they've done is a is a crime. It is a felony. They wouldn't allow us to get away with it. They're human, too. And I don't think that they should be above the law at all, and especially it, through experience. And in the year and a half, the two of you were together, there was never an instance of any physical altercations, anything along those lines? Not at all. And it's, and it's unfortunate to know that the people... Um, the organization, the, the Rockets, you know, just five days before this incident, we were out to dinner with the general manager and his wife. You had the owner of the organization say that uh, out of all the players that he's ever had, that Kevin was by far his favorite. It, it goes to show you what they thought about who we were together as a couple, that I wasn't, you know, uh, detrimental to his career and he wasn't detrimental to mine. So it's disheartening to know that the false allegations that uh, was put forth by someone who's supposed to be credible could add value and change the perception of how people just viewed us collectively and individually. It's 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 unfortunate and it and it's sad and and I hope that you know as we're on our separate paths you know to just remain independent um, through these legal spaces and that hopefully you know restoration. Um, will give us a sense of peace at some point. Well, Kaiser, um, you could have talked to a lot of folks. I appreciate uh, you coming to us here at Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network uh, to share your story. Uh, please uh, keep us uh, in the loop. Hopefully you will hear back from Manhattan uh, District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Uh, I, I, I can tell you I'll be re uh, reaching out to him directly. Also, would love to hear uh, uh, from him as well with regards to uh, this case and whether uh, he will sit with you as well as your attorneys to talk about uh, what you are calling uh, in a, a fraudulent account, and you, and you literally use those words uh, in your Twitter post, October 18th, uh, a fraudulent account by his assistant district attorneys. I appreciate it, and I am thankful for you giving me this platform to share my truth. Thanks a bunch, uh, and you take care. You do the same. Be blessed. Folks, I'll be back to talk to my panel about this. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
right here on the Black Star Network. Uncle Roro, have a great day. Happy birthday, Uncle Roro. What's up, David? Happy birthday. Just want to officially welcome you to the 55 and older retirement club. I have your AARP documents when you get, get to Houston next week. Love you, man. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. I just want to say, wish my friend a happy birthday. You know, I can't be there, but I know there will be a lot of folks there to represent me. Now, you're at an age where you can kind of mellow out a bit, keep on an uprise, or let everyone know how who you are and where you are. But in any case, knowing you, you're going to be doing all of that and more. And as you have a right and you deserve to, my friend. So I wish you a very happy birthday with many happy and blessed returns of the day. And the fact that you're an Alba, I'm okay with that because you listen well to this good Omega man. So God bless you, brother. I love you. Keep up the vibe, making it happen. Peace. Folks, I want to welcome my panel right now. Glad to have them uh, on the show. Uh, Robert Patillo. Uh, he is the host of uh, People, Passion, Politics, 1380 WAOK out of Atlanta. Rebecca Carruthers, Vice President of Fair Election Center out of D.C. Joy Cheney, founder of JOI Strategies out of D.C. Robert, I'll start with you. What do you make of what Kaiser Gondrasik just said in that 45-minute interview? Uh, well, it's a tough, tough subject matter. You know, I worked at the domestic relations court while I was in law school in Chicago, uh, handled domestic uh, cases for probably about the first five years of practice. Uh, and and these cases are always tough, for, particularly when it comes to intimate partner violence. Uh, often there is a both financial and social pressure for the victim uh, to make statements that are uh, in support of the, uh, the accused in the case. I do think there are some questions that the prosecution is going to have to answer. We'll regards to the information they've gathered and present to the public. Uh, I found it interesting that she was not with uh, her attorney, not with counsel while having this interview, not having someone to uh, kind of help her navigate through some of the minefields of things that could be said. Uh, I found it interesting that there was not a contemporaneous physical examination that could have cooperated many of her statements, uh, particularly as to well, the injuries that took place and the causation thereof, um, that there were no pictures of the, uh, of the apartment or of the crime scene uh, that could help to indicate well, the nature of the altercation that took place, uh, as well as uh, witnesses or individuals who were with Kevin Porter and herself earlier in the night, uh, they could talk towards their state of mind, towards their, if there was any ongoing arguments that happened beforehand. These are all things that we would want to present in a court of law that, uh, in order to create a circumstantial case around um, the accusations being made. Of course, none of us were there at the time being, uh, at the time the incident took place, and therefore it will be up to the, uh, the prosecution and to the judge and the jury um, there in New York 
short, but it's, of course, a tragic situation to have a young man whose livelihood and career uh, may be a, on the line based on something that, uh, according to the alleged victim, did not occur. Uh, however, there has to be, in many cases, the state has to step in to protect the victim from themselves. Uh, when victims uh, feel that there is pressure upon them not to press charges against the assailant. So the, the prosecutor's job in this case is very difficult, and I think there will be a searching inquiry taking place, particularly given the high-profile nature of this. And I'm just hoping that all parties come to a resolution um, that is best for them. And I think that the, the basketball career, the uh, other parts of this, that should be completely secondary towards finding out exactly what the truth is in the situation and finding justice for all parties involved. Well, I think, uh, I mean, look, um, uh, Rebecca, I, I, I sort of look at this, you know, I, I get what Robert is saying. Uh, I've interviewed lots of people, and they, the attorneys have required uh, themselves to be present. Her attorney wasn't present. This, this, this was a 26-year-old woman who said, I can do this myself. I can speak for myself. Uh, this wasn't a statement that was posted just on social media. This was in her own voice. Um, and in fact, um, guys, get this audio ready. Myra Kurzer, and, 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 uh, and, and uh, you heard her say this. You heard Kaiser say this. Myra, Myra Kurzer, an assistant district attorney at the Manhattan DA's office, she admitted in talking to Kaiser's mother that they put out the narrative, the narrative that was put out to the public was done so because Kaiser did not make a statement to the police. Listen. We, as you said, you needed to state, make those statements. You apologize for them. I made those statements in order to, for the enforcement, for the charges that you were, that you all were arraigning him for. So in order to make that stick. In order to make out the elements of the crime, we had, we put as little information on the record as we could, but we did have to provide some information in order to make out the elements of the crime. That's the so job. So to make out the elements of the crime, what picture are you painting and trying to paint? Because it's also, and, and as you say from the police report or the policeman, because that's also a falsity, where did she give anyone a statement that she was punched in the eye five times? If it is false, this is why we always want to speak to victims of crimes as quickly as possible to make sure that we have everything correct, to make sure that we are proceeding in a way that is true that is most just and that is takes into account everything that our victims need and so, you, so of, in that so in it, that it, since you, you may not have that then you are unjust in printing something that is inaccurate and that's what you all are doing i feel that's like what you're doing point, I'm so sorry for how difficult this has been i'm actually here with my supervisor at the moment would you like to speak to her no, you all will just, we'll, we'll talk at a later time. So Kaiser is on the phone and just for like the record, to come in with so, 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 so just on the record, she's not pressing any charges. So you do as you see fit, as you see will, she's not pressing any charges. So all of the false duplicitous statements that you've attached to her name for the procurement of your elements to the case, you can do it as you see fit. She has it's, not I, given I'm you sorry. any statements, I, and she is not filing any charges against that Mr. Porter. Works, unfortunately. Okay. Well, unfortunately, oh, you won't have her. You won't have her voice, nor will you have her cooperation. She is not filing not any charges. From you. I okay, need go ahead, Kaiser. You, you would like to say that? You can say that for the record, honey. And I would. I am not pressing any charges against Brian Porter Jr. And okay, I did not give. Fine. I did not give a consent nor did I do a written statement, nor did I not do a video stating that everything that has been released or things that were stated in the arraignment came from me personally. I hear you. I absolutely hear where you're coming from. I would, would like you to come in and speak to us in person. Um, can you come in meet with us tomorrow? That is not happening. I, I, I said to you earlier about Kaiser and her, she's resting. And so she is in, in right now, she has a headache and she, this is overwhelming for her. You have implored beyond four times. Yesterday, you tried to implore her three times as I had to remind you, please do not ask anymore. She is resting. 
She had just returned into that space where she could come from the hospital to rest, and you were continuing and persisting and insisting on trying to meet with her. You did yeah. not have her best interest at heart. It was all about you trying to get your paper and your work and your documentation in by a certain constraint of time. So I don't think we have anything else that we need to say or anything else that needs to be discussed. Kaiser, do you need anything else you need to say, dear? No, just that. Okay, you can hang up the phone. So, so Rebecca, again, I, I've covered many of these stories, and we know the countless stories where a woman has been the victim of domestic violence and has uh, recanted. Uh, Kaiser clearly stated to me that was not the case for her. But here's what I still find to be striking. How can you, as the DA's office, how can you release information that you actually didn't get from the alleged victim? That, that's what's still standing out to me. How, like, how do you get all of these things happen? And, and look, I, I can, look, I am a native of Houston. I grew up watching the Houston Rockets. The moment I saw this story, I was like, oh, get that son of a bitch off of the Rockets team. So the narrative that they, and, and, and guess what happened? He was immediately, can't be anywhere near the team. He was shortly traded to Oklahoma City. They cut him. He's now out of the NBA and is in limbo from the NBA until after the, the, these legal proceedings. And so, but still, go back. They released a narrative of what happened that wasn't based upon actual facts from the person, and there were only two people in the room. So, Roland, this is where it gets um, complicated when you have someone who's not willing to um, cooperate with police. So, first of all, Kaiser doesn't need to fill out a report in order for um, charges to be pressed against Kevin. True. Like, that's the first thing. It's the obvious thing, but it's just something that I, I want to point out. The second thing, based upon the police seeing how she looked, based upon her cognizance of their saying, hey, we think something happened here, so we're going to go ahead and arrest them. We're now going to figure out, based upon the evidence that we're able to collect, based upon things we're able to see, and usually based upon the other um, person who's involved um, participating um, and letting them know, hey, this is what happened, this is what didn't happen. But it looks like here, Kaiser was not participating. Um, she was not talking to the police. She was not talking to even their domestic violence um, unit. So instead, they looked at, oh, it, it sounds like what happened in the DA's office. They saw, okay, it looks like there's some injuries. These injuries, based upon um, pre based, based upon um, things we've seen before, seems consistent with, you know, there could be some domestic violence here. So we're going to reach out to her and tell her, hey, please let us know if this was a domestic violence issue. At the point that she refused to um, participate in this part of the investigation, they decided to move forth uh, and um, arraigning him, charging him and arraigning based upon uh, what they were able to see. So is that them saying that Kaiser affirmatively told us that um, Kevin beat her up? No. No, no, so no, 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 no. Here's the actual, here's the actual, and again, I'm not I'm just, I'm, I'm going by simply what we know and what Kaiser said. This is the actual, this is right here. This is the criminal court of the city of New York, the people of the state of New York against Brian Porter. Uh, he's a defendant, okay? This is the actual, what we have here. This is what it says. The factual basis, no, let me go up to the top. They wrote in this complaint that was signed by a New York police officer on or about September 11, 2023, at about 6.13 a.m. inside 1 UN Plaza in the county and state of New York, the defendant, with intent to cause serious physical injury to another person, caused such injury to another person, the defendant, with intent to impede the normal breathing and circulation of the blood of another person, applied pressure on the throat and neck of such person, and thereby cause stupor loss of consciousness for any period of time and any other physical injury and impairment. The defendant with intent to cause physical injury to another person, cause such injury to another person. This right here is why I stopped you. 
They say, quote, the factual basis for these charges are as follows. I am informed by a person known to the district attorney's office informant one that she observed the defendant strike her repeatedly about the face with a closed fist, causing a laceration above her right eye and bruising and substantial pain to her face. I am further informed by informant one that she observed the defendant use his hands to apply pressure to her neck by forcefully squeezing it, causing her to experience difficulty breathing, redness and bruising to her neck, and substantial pain. I am informed by police officer Komiko uh, Ketelorito, Shield 24212450, the 17th Precinct, that she was present when medical staff at NYU Langone Medical Center discussed with informant one the results of medical testing revealing that informant one suffered a fractured vertebrae in her neck. So, and this is, if you go down here, it says signed by police officer Patrick Amato uh, on September 11th, 2023. So the officer is literally saying she told him these things. This is where I'm confused. She says, I didn't talk to him. The assistant DA is on tape saying we didn't get a statement from her. So now I go back to how do you arrive at these very specific things that she never said? Right. Then at that point, her attorneys need to file an official complaint against the Manhattan DA's office. If the story from um, uh, from her team is that this did not happen, and even seeing that, yes, she and even you um, confirmed that the DA's office have dropped one of the charges, the um, vertebrae, the injured, the fractured vertebrae um, charge, that they dropped that. One thing that I thought was interesting. Um, from um, her interview with you is that she mentioned that he did not intentionally try to harm her. One of the things I was looking for was whether or not she was saying if he harmed her at all, whether it was intentionally or unintentionally. It's clear that something, it might not have been domestic violence, it may have been as um, simple as she mentioned, standing on the bed, um, being disoriented, falling over, hitting her face. It is clear that she left that hotel room and there was some type of visible injury, some type of visible injury that caused um, an ambulance to be called for her to be evaluated and then sent to the hospital to be evaluated. Generally, with domestic violence, um, altercations when police are involved there are pictures taken so i am curious to see if there's right. video if there's pictures and I, I think we would i think the manhattan da um needs to answer and address that at this point uh joy that's that's why i asked her was there a physical assault she said no she said that so and again in in, in, in her words she said that hey he came in uh, arguing, yelling, had been drinking. She's like, why in the hell are you tripping? She says she jumps up on the bed, falls over, hits her head. She's trying to figure out why, like, why is he going off? And then she runs out of the room because uh, she says she's disoriented. I, again, as somebody who's in the media, we narrative, this is the thing that I think is, is, is critically important. And Rauda's attorney understands this as well. Narratives are critically important. Because, Joy, when the narrative is established from the outset, it's hard to walk that thing back. The narrative that was released by the DA's office, and with this statement, this was the narrative. Kevin Porter, troubled NBA player who had issues, on attitude issues with the Rockets, attitude issues with Cleveland, attitude issues when he was in, uh, was in college, daddy who was shot and killed, Kevin Porter beat the shit out of this woman in New York. Bruised face, fractured her neck. His ass should be kicked out of the NBA. That was literally the narrative. For me, again, listening to Kaiser, listening to what she said, listening to the recording and seeing the statement, I still don't get 
how do you list that she said these things if they, we now see she never actually said it? You assuming it's one thing, but giving the impression that she actually said it, that's totally different. Totally different. Kaiser was failed, and it sounds like Kevin was failed by the justice system in this case and so many others. She's absolutely right that this is not just about her or him. This is about the broader issue. Um, I also want to say that her attorneys, if, if she has them, um, I wish they were here tonight, and I wish that they had been on the phone with the uh, DA instead of her mother. Um, that that whole scenario um, leads me to some other questions um, about who's in control of this conversation. Um, and is Kaiser's voice really being heard um, as well? And I think that she does need to be spoken to alone with an attorney and with, um, with the DA's office. But if, in fact, what she's saying is true, they need to be looking with a, the a, attorney general, uh, the attorney general, but uh, they also need to be talking about the officer. Officer Amato, where, I mean, the things that he put forth uh, seemed very specific. And if that didn't happen, then that wasn't a true statement. And, and listen, so, I, 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 yeah. I, like Robert, right? I totally, I totally hear what you're saying about when individuals who are involved in domestic violent cases, again, I, I remember when Warren Moon um, uh, went on trial and was found not guilty uh, of, uh, uh, of assaulting his wife, and she was in court, and she was ex exuberant and was praying, but uh, she was the one who they alleged was the one who gotten beat. We we've seen this. We've seen cases where women have recanted uh, the stories. We we've seen that. I guess what's what and again as somebody who just who operates in a world of facts, how do you make how do you make the claim she said it, but now we know she never said it? And how well, and, well, the, the officer. How? Yeah. <laughs> I think the officer has some explaining uh, to do. Robert, I, I don't understand it. Well, well so I, I think we're dealing with two different things when we say did she say it or not. Now, she said that she did not uh, have an official statement. She did not sit down with an officer where they took down her statement, and uh, then that was transcribed and put into the report. That does not mean she did not say it directly to the officer, maybe in an excited utterance or uh, said it to the security personnel that went down the stairs with her or was in the elevator with her. That's a fact-specific inquiry. No, 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 um, no, no, no. The, the DA, well, assistant oh, DA, they had, and we had the recording, where she apologized, she apologized for, for what was the details that were released because, cue it up, because I, I, I want to hear it in her own words, no, I, it up, because she apologized saying that that was released because we didn't have a chance to talk to you. So why are you releasing information? I, 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 listen, you, you, can, you can, there can be an, here's a, and again, a person does not have to be immediately arrested and perp walked. You can actually have an investigation and they can be a person of interest or whatever and you can say there's an ongoing investigation, do your investigation, they can be later, later arrested. That's not what happened here. They, it, was, it was like, yo, September 11th that morning, he was let out in handcuffs, boom, that story dropped, go. And then this is why I'm saying that it's a fat intensive inquiry. The the security personnel that she said let him into the room that went down the elevator, Wilter, or is, is that the person who made the statement to police as to what happened? Uh, no, 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 no. That's not. That's not. No, no. They, I'm, I'm giving you hypotheticals as to what. No, 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 no. I, I'm not going by hypotheticals. I'm going by well, what's well, in the side. No, 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 Robert, Robert, Robert. A hypothetical is what we use when we we don't we don't have we have right here the actual statement from the cop who says. I am informed by informant one. Now, here's that, sh that she, uh, okay, here's the problem. When I first read this, it sounded like somebody else was in the room. But it says, I am informed by a person known to the district attorney's office, informant A, that she observed the defendant strike her repeatedly about the face with a closed fist. That means the cop is saying, Kaiser informed me that Kevin yeah. hit her in the face. 
Okay, and so so what I what I'm saying, Roland, is now the officer may be saying that this was an excited utterance. They were in the ambulance headed to the hospital. He was in the hospital room with their No, no, thing. Robert. But then, Robert, but none of that's on. in hold here. On, let, but hold on, then but then when it was time to make a formal report, she did not make a formal report. That's the only point that I'm making. Why I'm saying it's a fact intensive inquiry. And that before No, 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 Robert, I get it. You're adding stuff to it that rotate. I need to hear this be the case all we want to proceed on is what is accurate obviously right so and i understand and i know that you guys have been through and discussed what had happened in the past and where that came from from what the doctors had said and when that the complaint was drafted that you have seen that was based upon the information that Mira believed to be true and accurate at the time she definitely understands as we all do now you know, that your injury was pre-existing and was not caused um, as part of this incident, but that was not something that was known at the time. And again, we apologize as, you know, an office, we, we strive to do our very best, um, as certainly I know Mira does in every single case that, that she pause. handles. Put that on pause. To make sure okay, here's why I'm gonna put that on pause. She said that wasn't known at the time. Again, I guess here's my problem. This, this, is, this is just my problem here. The affidavit was signed on September 11th at 2150. That's when it was signed, okay? They say in here that they were present, a cop was present when the medical staff told her that she suffered a fractural vertebrae in her neck. So they sort of came to that conclusion. So there's in here, the, the reason why I, I just think this is, this is critically important. And again, I'm not taking, I don't, I don't know Kaiser. I don't know Kevin Porter. I don't, I don't know any of these people. But the reason I do think it is important is because we do know examples where there are prosecutors who want to convict people and they want a notch on their belt. And we've seen these things happen. When Kaiser says they offer him a plea deal, what do we know as African Americans? That black people have taken plea deals who actually didn't commit crimes in order to just put it behind them. If you're Kevin Porter and you're sitting here facing time in jail or a $100 million NBA contract, you might take a plea deal just to start restart your career. That's why I just believe facts are important. And I would hope that Alvin Bragg sits with them because if what she's saying did not happen, and again, she's saying, I'm not protecting Kevin Porter. We, we, we know what happens in domestic violence cases. I just believe that the Manhattan DA's office needs to be focused on facts. What actually happened? And if there was a rush to judgment here, and if they released a narrative that didn't happen, Kevin Porter Jr. should not be facing prosecution. And so we'll see how this thing rolls out, but I'm just a little bothered when somebody says, I am informed by a person known to the DA's office, informant one, that she observed the defendant strike her repeatedly. I am further informed by informant one that she observed the defendant use his hands to apply pressure to her neck by forcefully squeezing it. I causing her to experience difficulty breathing, redness and bruising to her neck, and substantial pain. When I hear that, it sounds to me like she told the cops that. And if she didn't, why was they, this put into a complaint? And I go back to the line right here, above the cop's name. False statements made in this written instrument are punishable as a Class A misdemeanor pursuant to Section 210.45 of the penal law and as other crimes. So either the cop is wrong and he put something that wasn't right, or she is saying this now to protect Kevin Porter Jr. It's either one of two things. So we'll see it actually what happens. Going to a break, we come back. Gary Chambers talks about the Louisiana and I'll talk about Arkansas Senator Tom's Cotton, who don't give a damn about black people, all of a sudden, now he does when it comes to menthol cigarettes. I got a few words.
You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Be sure to support us in what we do, folks. Uh, of course, uh, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible to do what we do. We, we are covering stories other people are not even touching, aren't even dealing with, and so it absolutely matters. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037. Dash 0196. Cash App is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Be sure to download the Black Start Network app. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And of course, be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available bookstores nationwide. Get the audio version. Yes, I read it on Audible. We'll be right back. Happy 55th birthday, Roland. We Happy. love you, son. Yeah, your dad and I are very proud of you. You know, uh, Grandma Betty always said double nickel. So happy double nickel uh, birthday. This is a milestone. Can't believe that you're 55. And um, we decided to do a little bit something real quick, the last minute, to highlight from, from when you were little. Um, you were always involved in something, you and your siblings. That's, that's why I named you Rolling, because you just keep on rolling. Yeah, yeah, when I was in labor, it was only three, three and a half hours, and you were out, and that was it. So um, we just uh, are very, very honored to be your parents. We're humbled to be your parents. And we just pray that the, ne the years to come where you will still continue to find favor with God and we will always be praying for you. I'm proud of you, son. Love you. Keep on rolling. What's up, Roland? I uh, just wanted to wish you a happy birthday and uh, you're enjoying your special day. Peace. on Saturday, voters in Louisiana go back to the polls. There is a runoff election there for several statewide and local races. One closely watched race is between Nancy Landry and Gwen Collins Greenup for the Louisiana Secretary of State job. Now, the state's office that holds the highest legal authority is between Liz Baker Mural and Lindsey Cheek. John Fleming and Dustin Granger are battling for the state treasurer's job. Uh, joining us now from Baton Rouge uh, to discuss the election is Gary Chambers Jr., uh, activist there. Uh, Carol, which one of these folks we try to reach out to and uh, they won't come on the show? Okay, all right, so because we, we've, uh, those folks out of Mississippi, all right, all right, so let me know because you know, we reached out because uh, the folks in Louisiana need to be trying to come on here uh, and get some and get some that gun votes. So they need to do that real quick. Uh, it's Wednesday. The election is Saturday. They need to get the word out. Uh, and to me, that's, that, that, that's, that's part of the deal. I, I, get, I get if you're campaigning uh, uh, locally uh, in the state, Gary, uh, but if you got an opportunity to be doing national media interviews, you need to do that because uh, it's not like folk don't know folk in Louisiana. That's a fact, Roland. And when you only had 8,000 black folks show up to early vote in Baton Rouge, you definitely need to be talking to more people and getting people out to vote and getting people encouraged uh, about your campaign because not enough people are engaged. Uh, only 8,000 black folks in Baton Rouge went to vote, 6,000 in New Orleans, uh, 6,000 in Cattle, which is where Shreveport is, in Washington, 1,300 black people went to vote, Roland. 
in St. John the Baptist Parish, 2073, in Lafayette, 3037, and in Rapids, 1,072 people went to early vote uh, in an election. And to put that into perspective, there's 127,000 black people in Baton Rouge that are registered to vote. 8,000 of them went to vote. You know, I, look, we talked about these Louisiana Democrats. Um, uh, did we try to get the Democratic Party chair to come on? She ain't gonna come on. No, nah, she ain't gonna come on. We tried. Call call her ass every day. Call her tomorrow <laughs> and Friday. Uh, what's her name? Katie Bernhardt. Yeah. You know, she yeah. should resign, Roland. She should resign. When you have numbers like this, New Orleans has 142,000 registered black voters, 6,772 showed up to vote. Caddo Parish has 72,000 registered black voters, 6,318 of them showed up to vote. The only thing that, that is in the 318 that they, they doing is playing around because they also have a sheriff's race coming up right now where a guy is talking about bringing in stop and frisk in the street for it, right? And so 6,000 black folks went to vote when you got a man who's on the ballot right now that is going to bring stop and frisk back that has openly said this on your news station, but Katie Bernhardt in the Democratic Party, we can't find him. But not just Katie Bernhardt in the Democratic Party. The senators and state representatives who had an easy ride by not being challenged, we have not seen them mobilizing people, and the proof is in the numbers. If they were doing the work, it would show up in the, the tally of voters. Yeah, and when you got runoffs, you don't have as many people, so you can actually concentrate uh, your efforts uh, on, on the runoff there. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's as if uh, folks just, Louisiana, they just gave up. It, it is disappointing because you have Jeff Landry, who has uh, won the governor's race, who has already started a transition committee uh, that is just focused on New Orleans. Now, New Orleans has some of the lowest voter turnout, and the new governor is going to be focusing directly on you. But you have the ability to prevent him from, get it, from getting there. And now there's an opportunity on Saturday, if people show up, to put a checks and balances by having Gwen Collins Green up as the Secretary of State, having uh, Lindsey Cheek as the Attorney General, having Dustin Granger as the Treasurer. But not just that, we've got Cedric Glover running for a Senate seat in Shreveport. We've got Daryl Joy Walters running for a state rep seat in Shreveport. And Charter Banks in Scotlandville here in Baton Rouge will be a slugger in the legislature against Jeff Landry if we put her in. There, but people have to show up and do their job for the people who have put their names on the line and will go down there and fight. We always talk about who's going to fight for us. There are people willing to fight for you. There are people willing to write meaningful legislation, but they can't win if 6,000 people in the whole damn city showed up to vote. Um, look, you got... Uh, so w w I saw, saw one story that Jeff Landry, who's attorney general, who will be who's going to be the next governor, is already talking about withholding funds from New Orleans if the local DA does not, does not prosecute abortion cases? Is that true? There were things that Jeff Landry did as attorney general that people believe that he's going to carry out as governor. Uh, that is somewhat some speculation, but he has created a transition committee focused on New Orleans. He has talked about crime being a major issue for him. You know, last year at some point, New Orleans was listed as the most murderous city uh, in America. And so when you look at this, Jeff Landry should be focused on economics and how do we improve the economy of Louisiana because our economy ranks number 50. You can't police your way out of this, but to people in New Orleans who are sitting on their tails and not going to vote and spending a lot of time watching the Keith Carroll show, you should get up and go vote because at the end of the day, Keith Carroll and the internet ain't going to save you from the changes that are going to come when state police is harassing you in your community. And so the people who have these platforms in our community, they are great voices and we appreciate them, but we got to encourage our people to go do their part. Um, you know, Rebecca, this is the thing that I have been talking about uh, incessantly. I'm looking at next year. I'm hearing a lot of people out here saying, and, and I, I keep trying to convey to our people, you can't, you can't be on one hand complaining about what's not happening and what you want and what should be happening. You can't be complaining about, uh, well, uh, Biden did, didn't get criminal justice reform without understanding has to pass the House, has to pass the Senate, has to come to them. The George Floyd Justice Act passed the House, stalled in the Senate. He can't sign nothing unless it come through the Senate. And so, and I sit here and go, okay, so now if you're mad about that, step back and go, okay, where was the block? Well, Republicans now control the House. 
They ain't even brought up the George Floyd Justice Act. So sitting out an election again, to me, is about the dumbest thing in the world. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> just with the power of the number of black folks in Louisiana, they could definitely turn the state around. Something that's important in a question I even would ask for Gary is that the Democratic Party in Louisiana is a mess. The current chair wasn't properly recruiting candidates, raising money, doesn't appear to be showing up um, in the different communities. The previous chair of the party is in prison for, for stealing money from the party. So it's been years, even decades, of ineptness with the party. So I am curious to even hear from Gary, like, what's next for him? Is he going to take over the party? Is he going to work um, as a um, activist across the state? Because it has to be local people in in um, Louisiana that's um, helping pulling together black communities to make sure that black communities stay politically engaged and actually using their outsized voice that they can have in Louisiana. Well, I definitely don't want to run the party. Uh, I think that there are other people who have uh, the bandwidth to do that, and I don't want that many boys, bosses, bosses uh, who haven't done the work to tell me how to do the work. Uh, for me, I think that what we need is a, a leader who has the capacity to raise money uh, and somebody who's not a, afraid to do the hard work of touching the voters in these communities around the state. I launched an effort called Civics for the People, which is a voter education effort, because at the end of the day, one of the reasons a lot of people don't participate is they don't even understand half of what Roland just broke down, that this is the process that goes through in order to pass a bill, in order to make things happen in our community. These are the roles that each person does. When I was running for uh, Congress, I had people asking me about things that your city council members should do, right? If people don't have an understanding of what the government does, then they're not going to participate in the process just because we say vote. And so that has been a, a key effort for me, voter education. But someone like me has to be able to raise the resources to do that. And so I'm one individual doing that work, but the Democratic Party has the bandwidth to do that on a larger scale. And Cedric Richmond uh, helped put Katie Bernhardt there uh, as the chair of the party, and the party is failing. And so people like Cedric, who have the ear of the president, they are ignoring this state while focusing on states like South Carolina. And Louisiana has a higher population of black people than South Carolina, but we're ignoring this state. Joy. Yes, I'm here. Look, one of the questions I have for you, Gary, is one, I think Rebecca's right. You need to consider it. But two, what do you need organizations to do who are working alongside you? Do you find that the major groups, the NAACP, the NUL, um, the sororities, the fraternities, how are they engaging with you in this work? Even though they are nonpartisan, obviously they have a vested interest in making sure we have the right people elected who carry out their views and their values and their causes and cares. What do we need to be doing on the ground in a nonpartisan way to get people educated and then you ask them to vote? Well, when you talk about the Divine Nine specifically, we need black leaders who aren't afraid to take positions on voting. Uh, that they organize outside of the bandwidth of their organizations and actually get into the communities and touch people. When you talk about the legacy organizations, I can say the NAACP uh, has been one of the most active organizations in the state. Uh, we're trying to mobilize people, but they need more resources in order to expand that work. Uh, in order to touch more people. They also need younger people involved. We've got to find ways to touch younger people and get them involved because there are ways that we're just not talking to people digitally. We're not activating people in a, a, a real-time way. Um, and as a result, we're missing tons of people. Uh, when I ran for office, people asked me, how did I do so well making less money raising less money than the candidates I ran against. I was on TikTok talking to young people in ways that other candidates were not. And so when you don't have the resources, how are you being creative with the tools that you do have to contact the people within your community? And whether you're mobilizing 10 people or 10,000 people, if you're mobilizing people, you're making an impact. Robert? Uh, Gary, thank you so much for all the work that you, you're doing, being so active on the ground. Uh, one of the things that we had here in Georgia was a very similar situation demographically to what Louisiana has. We have over 30 percent African-American population. Demographically, on paper, the state should be a purple state, but we were a deep red state because of voter suppression for um, the better part of 30 years. And a big part of that was the lack of registration for African-Americans in the state. We had, at one point in time, 300,000 unregistered black voters in the state, completely eligible to vote, just not registered. Uh, 
anticipate there are probably similar numbers in Louisiana. What efforts are being made to register those unregistered black voters and then to turn them out at the polls? Well, brother, I don't think we necessarily have a registration effort. We have 937,000 registered black voters, and I just told you we had less than probably 50,000 of them show up to early vote. It, it is a mobilization effort here in Louisiana. It is a resource deficit here in Louisiana. Uh, what has helped uh, us in a tremendous way is, is being able to talk to people and connect to people. But if you don't have the resources to talk to more people and connect with more people, that's just the limitation and the cap. I can tell you that there are qualified candidates. Sean Wilson was a hell of a candidate that ran for governor. He had $3 million, right? And so when you talk about how did Raphael Warnock become successful in Georgia, he had $80 million, right? It, you cannot compete in these races with bare bones uh, funding and think that these candidates are going to be able to be successful. Gwen Collins Greenup, this is her third time running for Secretary of State. The last time she made the runoff, she had $10,000. She got 44% of the vote with $10,000. Well, now, that says a whole lot. Well, uh, we'll see what happens. I hope bl black folks uh, uh, turn out. Again, I, I, just, I just keep saying, hey, folks, politics is not the be-all to end-all, but you won't get a damn thing if the people in power aren't the folks who give a damn about you. That's a fact, Roland. And, you know, it, politics touches every part of your life, whether you want it to or not. Ignoring it doesn't mean that it's ignoring you. They're taking your money out of your check every two weeks and they're putting it into a pot and they're deciding where that money goes. And if you're complaining about the streets and the parks and the schools in your community and wondering why there's not more investment, there's not enough people in your community showing up, when it counts and one of the simplest things to go around the corner from your house and show up to vote to ensure that there are people down there advocating to make sure that resources come to your community. And if you want to be like the people that are billionaires and millionaires, they are all involved in politics. Why aren't you? And as I always say, voters shut the hell up. G Gary <laughs> Chambers, we appreciate it. Happy Thanks birthday, so brother. Thanks so much, brother. I appreciate it. All right, folks, we come back. Senator Tom Cotton. Oh, now he cares about black people. Y'all know his ass line. I'm going to break it down next on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Happy birthday, Roland. I hope you're having a great day. You deserve it all. Shout out to the ultimate alpha man. Thank you for everything that you do day in and day out for the black community. We love you. We appreciate you. You are a legend. And I hope you enjoy your day. Sending you all the love and light. Happy birthday, Uncle Roar, from your favorite oldest niece. I hope you enjoy your 55th birthday and you have many more to come. Thanks for all that you do. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr, we welcome the Black Star Network's very own Roland Martin, who joins us to talk about his new book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. The book explains so much about what we're going through in this country right now and how, as white people head toward becoming a racial minority, it's going to get, well, let's just say even more interesting. We are going to see more violence. We're going to see more vitriol because as each day passes, it's, it, it is a nail in that coffin. The one and only Roland Martin on the next Black Table, right here on the Black Star Network. Happy birthday, Uncle Roro. I know you're gonna come for my hair, but I'm studying for finals, so I get a pass. I don't wanna hear, comb your hair. I don't wanna hear about being ashy. And if you're so concerned about everybody being ashy, I'll give you some lotion for Christmas. So have a great day. Don't be rude to people. Play your music loud. Do your little Scorpio thing. But whatever. Have a good day, Rockhead Uncle. Uh, that was my niece, Chloe. Uh, and so, Chloe, uh, I will have some lotion for your little ashy ass uh, when I see you next week for Thanksgiving. Just letting you know. All right, y'all. So, 
Y'all already know I, I hate cigarette smoke. I can't stand cigarette smoke, y'all. I'm allergic to smoke. Um, it's gotten in my system before, and it just flat out drives me crazy. So I ain't got no problem standing with the people who are against um, who are against uh, menthol cigarettes. But you know what I can't stand? I, I can't stand when somebody who don't give a damn about black people all of a sudden wants to take a shot at the Biden administration and they want to pimp black people while trying to do it. So I'm talking about Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton. Now, this is the man, y'all, who said that he opposed the First Step Act. He said we should be putting more people in prisons. This is the same SOB who attacked Pentagon Secretary, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin uh, against DEI, who is always attacking stuff in the interest of black people. This is the same SOB who sent a letter to law firms the week after the Supreme Court affirmative action decision saying that their programs uh, would be violating uh, the Constitution. Just decided on his own. Like, his little simple ass got some power. So, this fool tweeted this today, and I had to deal with it. Pull a tweet up. Pull a tweet up. He goes, Joe Biden wants to ban menthol cigarettes, which are favored by black smokers. Meanwhile, he wants to legalize weed for white college kids and mail out free crack pipes. But pull the next one up, because there was two of them, right? Okay, all right, because I thought that was another one that he had posted. And I saw that, and I was like, I know this punk didn't. And yeah, I'm calling him a punk because that's what he is. Now, Senator Tom Cotton don't give a damn about the black voters in Arkansas. He don't care. All he cares about are his hardcore... No, that guy, that was the second tweet, okay? Um, hold on, just, just stay right there because I need to blow this up. That was a second tweet. Y'all got to... Come on now. All right, get, go, just go to my iPad. His second tweet was... Uh, hold on, let me, let, me, let me connect it to... So, before I go... My, yeah, that was a second tweet. Second tweet. Go ahead. The administration's ban is paternalistic, it's hypocritical, and it creates a huge black market for Mexican cartels in Hezbollah, and all because Mike Bloomberg told him to. Y'all, Tom Cotton don't care about black people. Joy, he ain't fooling nobody with this here. And so, all of a sudden, Tom Cotton, oh, they want to get menthols, which black people like. Now, Tom Cotton ain't said nothing how the tobacco companies have been targeting black people over the last five decades. Tom Cotton ain't said nothing about how menthol cigarettes are the more addictive out of all cigarettes and how 82% black... See, he ain't talking about none of that, but now all of a sudden... Oh, it's paternalistic for them to want to ban menthols, but want to legalize weed for white kids. We got, we know exactly what this punk doing, and trust me, Tom Cotton is not a friend of black America. Tom Cotton is the biggest liar on the Hill, and there are a lot of liars on the Hill. And I don't use incendiary comments, but Tom Cotton, guys, if you remember, is an insurrectionist, at least he supported them, and was willing to overthrow the election, not certifying it, was willing to do that. Uh, he doesn't care about black people. He actually doesn't care about anyone. So I hope that not only are black people not following, but falling for his mess, but no one should be. He pulled together, strung together all kinds of words. So I bet it was a test for me and his staff. How do we get menthol, white kids, black kids, Hezbollah, and Bloomberg all in the same uh, tweet series. Right. He's a joke. And see, he, here's so, the whole... Here's the thing here, Robert, is hilarious. So, the proposed ban on menthol is going to, going to go after the production as well as the distribution uh, of menthol cigarettes. He's trying to make it sound like black people are going to be walking around... 
Man, I need to get that menthol cigarette. I need to get that menthol cigarette. And so, now he ain't said nothing about the thousands of black people who die every year because of menthol cigarettes. See, Mr. Pro-Life don't say nothing about that. Well, I also did not know that Hezbollah was selling loose squares down by the train tracks uh, or down by the green line. I was I was unaware of the Mexican cartel uh, dealing cools and uh, Joe Campbell down uh, you no know, down at Five Points or anything like that. But I, I said, look, Tom Cotton will make a deal with you since you're bought and sold by the tobacco lobby. Um, we'll trade you menthol cigarettes if you vote in favor of universal health care to handle the health issues that come from the uh, from the cigarettes you think are so important. Or we will trade you menthol cigarettes if you will release all the uh, African Americans who are currently serving prison sentences, both on the state, local, and federal level. Uh, for marijuana and other drug-related crimes. You release them, you can keep all the menthol cigarettes that you want. Uh, we will trade you uh, menthol cigarettes because you're bought and sold and paid for by the uh, tobacco lobby. If you will give us uh, free early childhood education so we can help educate kids out of wanting to use those cigarettes and explain the health uh, concerns around them. And there are plenty of things that we will trade you, but what he's really saying is that because the profits of the tobacco companies are in danger, because the, uh, the health of of tobacco companies is more important than the health of African Americans. He wants to use dog whistles in order to uh, to uh, make it seem as if uh, the regulations that are being put in place to help save the lives of black folks are somehow deleterious to it. When he doesn't uh, uh, he doesn't co uh, concern himself with that writ large. I've seen a very similar argument from our black conservative friends where they say, "Well, all this money is going to Ukraine that could be going toward reparations." And then you f have the follow up question: Are you saying you support reparations? Well, no, but I'm just trying to make the point. That is the only thing he's trying to do here. They're trying to discredit the president who's trying to save black people's lives by using these uh, canards in their place. And as I said, I'll be more than happy to negotiate with them so that he can keep the menthol cigarettes. But there's a few things on the list of uh, legislation that black folks are going to need in exchange for his little cancer sticks. And you know, Rebecca, uh, go to my iPad. Um, hmm. Tobacco companies gave $1.5 million to Trump inaugural and ramped up lobbying. They want to roll back FDA oversight of e-cigarettes and cigars. This is from Matthew Myers, the president, campaign for tobacco-free kids from April 21st, 2017. Hmm, I wonder who Tom Cotton is in the pocket of. I'm sorry, you cannot be white, defend slavery as a necessary evil, have the last name Cotton, and then try to tell me you care about black folks. Like, come on, Tom. Like Joyce said, he is one of the worst in the Senate, and that is such a low bar. That bar is in hell, and he's one of the worst. Oh, that's exactly it is. And so I, I just needed to, um, uh, uh, I, I need to point that out. Uh, because uh, Tom Cotton is an absolutely uh, despicable uh, person, a despicable individual. Thing. Go ahead. For the record, nothing that the Biden administration did to ban menthol cigarettes would create any carceral repercussions for anyone who smokes menthol cigarettes. So you don't have to worry about that. They didn't say that if you were smoking those cigarettes, you're going to go to jail or anything like this. It's about the production of menthol cigarettes that have been proven to be in incredibly dangerous and result in death for anyone who smokes them, pre predominantly African-Americans. It see is about health. It is not about the criminal justice system. But see, what was so arrogant here is, oh, uh, he want to ban the cigarettes for black people, but he want to get legalized marijuana for white kids. <laughs> it's been legal for white kids. Huh? <laughs> It's been legal for white kids. What is he talking about? Tell me how many white kids and white college kids are really getting arrested because they had possession of marijuana. Get out of here. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure, uh, Robert, Tom Cotton is just really spending a lot of time going around uh, to the black parts of Arkansas saying, here's what I'm going to do for y'all. I have just brought y'all some boxes of menthol cigarettes. And I want y'all to have a grand time, and I'm gonna do all I can, black people, uh, to do all. I'm gonna do all I can to make sure y'all, black people, get to keep smoking the menthol cigarettes and keep 
killing yourselves and driving up the health care costs, and I'm going to make sure we don't expand Medicaid expansion. And guess what? I'm going to also make sure we do some cuts to Medicare and Social Security so your, lung, so your, uh, uh, your smoke-infested lungs won't be able to get treated. That's what I'm going to do for you, black people. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's one little thing where you can tell they did not think this out, and he's also never actually said this in front of black people. I would love to see Tom Cotton Card go to the, the black side of Little Rock that we've all been to a couple times, you know, the one that seems a whole lot uh, 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 non-Arkansas-ish, uh, uh, and have the same speech in, like, at a street corner or a barbershop or something like that, explaining to the black folks why they need more menthol cigarettes and why cancer is actually good for them. I would love to see him make that, uh, that argument, but it's not going to happen. But this is a real case where we have to... Uh, uh, and the 24 campaign, start talking about how can we have campaign finance reform in American uh, elections again? Because since Citizens United, you can literally have a senator who's just sponsored by the cigarette industry, uh, just like the uh, NASCAR driver having a, a coat on with all his sponsors on it, and he will work harder for the people who sponsor him than for the people that voted for him. And that's a danger to our democratic system that we're seeing across the board right now. And for all the black folks watching, remember I told y'all what he did? Go to my iPad. This was the letter that uh, Tom Cotton sent to top law firms warning them about race-based hiring practices. So, yes, Tom Cotton do not... Tom Cotton don't want black people to get hired at law firms, but he damn sure wants you smoking menthol cigarettes. Hmm. Ain't that... Once you're dead and unemployed. <laughs> Precisely. I'll be right back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hey there, we just wanted to wish you, my big brother, a very, very happy birthday. Happy um, birthday. November 14th. Um, we're just sending you blessings and good wishes for um, another year and just praying God's best over you. Absolutely. Um, hoping everything goes well for you, and I know that uh, Jack's got big plans for you, so <laughs> happy to hear about that after it's all done and uh, just want you to know we love you and we're proud of you and look forward to connecting with you soon. Take care. We love you. Celebrate well. I'm Dee Barnes and next on The Frequency we have Rio, performance artist and author, writer, singer and composer, Queen Mother Nana Camille Yarbrough. Please join us for an incredible conversation with knowledge, wisdom, and power of the elders. I'm a perception changer. You're a real ranger. You're a mind evolver and a problem solver. You're a beast eater, a soul excreter, a void filler, and a bile spiller. You are a thought warmer, a plan former, a power orchestrator, and a tongue translator. Right here on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Happy birthday, Okororo. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, big head man. Out of all, out of all my brother-in-law's name, Roland, is by far my favorite one. <laughs> Have a very happy birthday, and we wish you many, many more. We love you very much. Love you. Hey, today is the one day of the year we all pretend you are the favorite child. Enjoy. Love you, big brother. Happy birthday. Missing from Montgomery, Alabama since June 29th, the 16-year-old is 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighs 145 pounds with light brown hair and brown eyes. Uh, anyone with information on Tatiana I. Allen should call the Montgomery, Alabama Police Department at 334-241-2651, 334-241-2651. Y'all, this has been the week of crazy Republicans, okay? Just, just crazy Republicans. So check this out. So Chip Roy was on the floor of the house today and was just outside of his mind in a speech. Listen to what this fool said. One thing. I want my Republican colleagues to give me one thing, one, that I can go campaign on and say we did. One. 
Anybody sitting in the complex, if you want to come down to the floor and come explain to me one material, meaningful, significant thing the Republican majority has done besides, well, I guess it's not as bad as the Democrats. One thing. You know what? That right, that right there, uh, Robert, is an ad that will write itself. You know, I'm trying to figure out what the hell Republicans' plan is right now. You have a Democratic president who's polling in the mid-30s. Uh, you have a Democratic Congress that is uh, very unpopular with the American people to split right down the middle on the uh, funding for Ukraine, funding for Israel, et cetera. Uh, and then the House Republicans just seem to say, hold my beer, I could be more crazy. Um, they depose Kevin McCarthy for working with, with Democrats on having a continuing resolution to keep the government open. Then the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, has a compromise with Democrats to keep the government open through a continuing resolution. You have the Republican debate where you have Vivek Ramswani and uh, Nikki Haley going back uh, back and forth with each other, uh, calling each other scum, etc. Donald Trump is doing not not jokes and your mama jokes about Chris Christie calling him a fat pig. Uh, and the Republican Party really thinks that this is going to be what happens to for the American people to hand the reins of power back over to them. They are a party in complete dysfunction. Uh, what used to be Tea Party crazy MAGA Republicans are now moderate rhinos in this current Republican Party. People like John Boehner, Eric Cantor, Paul Ryan are no longer welcome in the Republican Party. Uh, they did uh, John Boehner so bad he just became a weed head and drinks all day now. I'm not quite sure how they can form a governing coalition, but also Democrats are going to get their game together and capitalize uh, on this. You, you should not be running neck and neck with a party that's in complete disarray where you have George Santos at 21 felony counts, uh, Lauren Boebert getting felt up at the, stu uh, at the theater and everything else going on in the GOP, and y'all are barely beating them. Democrats are going to have to figure out a way to put some more distance between them and a party that's in free fall and collapse. You know what? Uh, I, I found a longer clip. Um, you know, I, let me just go ahead uh, and, pl and play this here, because I just, I found it to be fantastic. Rebecca, watch this. One thing. I want my Republican colleagues to give me one thing, one, that I can go campaign on and say we did. One. Anybody sitting in the complex, if you want to come down to the floor and come explain to me one material, meaningful, significant thing the Republican majority has done. There's not one person on earth that hates saying I told you so. And I'm not an exception. I love saying that shit. Not secretly, publicly. Representative Chip Roy, Republican from Texas District 21. Ah! You ain't no welcome to the fucking world. Republicans oh, don't do back. shit. They never have done shit. They don't have any plans to do shit. Oh, they just I, I, love, I love it so much because it's like, oh, we ain't done nothing. Make sure we don't get reelected. He said the quiet part out loud. I really want to see a TikTok remix of with Ray J's One Wish to go after him. He's like, one thing, and then just start playing One Wish right under it. <laughs> I mean, look, Chip's great. You know, like, keep it moving, Chip. Like, maybe, you know, in February, I'm expecting for <laughs> Republicans to kick out their current speaker, so maybe Chip to run and become the next speaker of the House and actually do something for the remaining months of the year um, leading up to the general election in 2024. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm glad he's speaking truth to power. Maybe there could be more. You know what? Hold up. I'm going to grab uh, one of these bottles of alcohol from my party over here. Uh, so, Joy, uh, <laughs> Joy, I'm going I'm to I'm do a reenactment of uh, <laughs> uh, Chip Roy. Uh, Anthony, give it a wide shot. All right, y'all. So I'm about to reenact for y'all Chip Roy on the floor of the house. We ain't doing shit. <laughs> we been here all this damn time. We been in charge, and we ain't done a damn thing. Matter of fact, why don't we all just have a drink together since we ain't done shit we ain't gonna do shit, we don't look like shit, and we simply ain't shit. I'm Chip Roy, <laughs> and I approve this message. <laughs> hey, man, he needs to hire you. This Chip change parties. <laughs> Chip, just no, change Chip, parties. No, Chip, take your drunk ass back home with that to Texas, and you and that other drunk ass Clay Huggins uh, or Higgins, whatever his name is, because they buy two of the dumbest people in Congress. It's insane. So, I mean, what is so crazy to me is that no matter what he's saying, 
I bet you if you asked him what he's going to do about it, the answer is pretty much nothing. Friends, you got to vote, and I'm not telling you who to vote for, but don't vote for people who will side with Tom Cotton and the likes of other Donald Trump and other people who only use you. They don't care about you. They don't care about you, and they haven't done one damn thing. Uh, and, and, the- and, uh, and again, again, uh, I'm trying to sit here, and y- y- y'all, this has got to be drunk-ass Republican week uh, on Capitol Hill. It's... <laughs> It, it, it's it's, it's, it's got to be drunk ass, because if, if y'all want to see... Uh, hold on, I'm trying to find... If y'all want to see uh, straight-up, no holes barred uh, uh, ignorance... Now, now, I just shot, now, Robert had to bounce. Now, I, I, I just showed y'all uh, uh, Chip Roy, but I'm going to tell you right now, the other dude who I think... He, he clearly has been greatly impacted... Uh, by long COVID because he he says some of the dumbest stuff uh, I have ever seen somebody say. And I'm talking about right here. Here's Clay Higgins. Go go ahead, y'all. That the FBI had that sort of engagement with your own agents embedded within to the crowd on January 6th. If you are asking whether the violence at the Capitol on January 6th was part of some operation orchestrated by FBI sources and or agents, the answer is emphatically You're saying no. No. You're saying no. Not violence orchestrated by FBI sources or agents. Capitol, can you confirm that the FBI... And that's sort of all right, all right, y'all. So that, and that, so this, that's in that clip. So he does that. Now the long, again, y'all, it's hilarious. The longer clip, uh, when the fool, he gonna try to sit here and try to show some. But give, give me one second. Let me try to find it. Okay, here we go. Here's. All right, roll it. Okay. Oh, here We're we go. Here we go. At the Capitol on January 6th was part of some operation orchestrated by FBI sources and or agents. The answer is emphatically. You're saying not. no. No. You're saying no. Not okay. violence orchestrated Let's by FBI on. sources or agents. Are you familiar with, with, you know what a ghost vehicle is? Director, your director of the FBI certainly should. You know what a ghost bus is? A ghost bus? Ghost bus. I'm not sure I've used that term before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's pretty common in, in law enforcement. It's a vehicle that's, that's used for secret purposes. It's painted over. <laughs> These two buses in the middle here, they were the first to arrive at Union Station on January 6th. 0500. I have all this evidence. I'm showing you a tip of this iceberg. Mr. Chairman. These two buses Mr. are Chairman. painted completely white. <laughs> These buses are nefarious in nature and were filled with FBI informants dressed as Trump supporters. You, and you, deployed onto our Capitol on January 6th. Mr. Chairman. Your day is your, coming, Mr. Your Ray. Point, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All Mr. Right. Chairman. Also- okay. All right. So, um, and they go to the, go to the wide shot. So I'm about to give y'all, I'm about to give y'all uh, a reenactment of uh, Clay Higgins. Uh, so here's here's Clay Higgins. Clay Higgins like uh, uh, FBI Director Ray. You ever yeah. heard you, your ass ever heard of some ghost buses? Some ghost buses. You ain't never heard no ghost buses. Some ghost buses are some clear ass buses you can't see. Cause they some ghost buses. And on them ghost buses, Mr. FBI director, them was some FBI informant ghosts that were on them ghost buses. <laughs> I think, Mr. and Mr. Head of the FBI, I think all over the Capitol on January 6th, it was a bunch of ghost FBI informants infiltrating the crowd, and we couldn't see them because they ghosts. Now, do y'all have a ghost task force at the FBI? And Chris Ray says, did you say do we have a GOAT task force? <laughs> no, man, I said in my Louisiana draw, do y'all have some ghost task forces? Because I know I saw some ghosts on them ghost buses. That's how his ass sounded, Rebecca. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> maybe he's, he has that free weed that um Tom Cotton Tom about. <laughs> like this is like Scooby Doo and the Mystery Machine. Like what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> Anytime you go to Union Station, it's filled with buses like that because they actually have parking for buses, especially when people are staging for events. And then nah, nah, say, nah, oh, Rebecca, well, I saw them go buses at five o'clock in the morning. And right now, they're there. And at 5 a.m., there's going to be buses there. And guess what? Everybody can see them. So they're not ghost buses. Because <laughs> we can see them. Like, nah, I, I nah, nah. People too. Nah, like, <laughs> Joy, that's some bullshit. I saw them ghost buses. And it was ghosts just all in them buses, just talking to each other. Ooh. And all of them are FBI informants. <laughs> Who you gonna call Ghostbusters? The only thing that will be ghost <laughs> is us if we allow these people to win. Please. I mean, how, who is supporting? Literally, are the people of Mr. Higgins' district being supported at all? This man is on TV humiliating you. He doesn't care whether you have clean water. He doesn't care if he's bringing money back. He is wasting time talking about Ghost buses? He is ridiculous. And the whole Republican Party is ridiculous. It's time. Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? Mr. Okay. Higgins, you need all right. To so, all right. I'm going to close the show out on this one because, see, here's what I think happened this week. So, yesterday, the senator from Oklahoma was going to fight the head of the Teamsters. And I think the senator from Oklahoma thought the head of the Teamsters was a ghost. <laughs> okay, so watch this, y'all. Come on. In the truck with me when I was building my. Sir, I wish you was in the truck with me when I was building my plumbing company. Myself and my wife was running the office because I sure remember working pretty hard and long hours. Pretends like he's self-made. What a clown! Fraud. Always has been, always will be. Quit the tough guy act in these Senate hearings. You know where to find me, any place, any time, cowboy. Sir, this is a time, this is a place. And come back on wide shot. Run your mouth. We can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Big oh, oh, stop it. <laughs> Is that your Fire. solution, every poll? Oh, no, no, sit down. Fire, sit down. Okay. No, you're a United States senator. Sit down. Actively. Oh, okay, okay. Sit down, please. All right. Can I respond? <laughs> Mr. Hold Jim. it. Hold it. If hold we can't... No, I have the mic. Said. I'm sorry. This is hold what it. he said. You'll have your time. Okay. See, Can Rebecca, I respond? Oh, no, see, Rebecca, can't. here's what happened. Here's what happened. We ain't done shit. Oh, no. Stand your ass up. I'm about to whip some ass with some ghosts. That's what these... <laughs> that's literally the week. And then you had... The dude said Kevin McCarthy hit him in the rear, hit him in the kidney. They trying to fight. Then you got... I, this literally has been the week of just some straight-up crackhead, meth-breaking bad moments for the Republican Party. I think all of them been drinking. Like, this was nuck if you buck week. Like, they were all just like, <laughs> we bucking. <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, look, do you remember? And damn, it ain't time? even Friday. It's Wednesday. <laughs> right, I it's remember when Wednesday. Republicans, yeah, every week it was infrastructure week. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I actually might turn on C-SPAN because it's crazy. Right, I, it, it's Wednesday. Joy, it ain't even Friday. It's crazy white people week. That was nuts. I can't even <laughs> believe it. Look, I worked in the Senate. I, standing up and threatening to attack a witness is outrageous, and I hope the Ethics Committee is looking at him. When do we get to say enough is enough if you're watching these people? And I assure you our enemies are watching us right now. And it's funny, but not so funny. Well, I, you I, broke I, week, I'm gonna leave. Isn't a good look. I'm gonna leave y'all. It's not a good look. It's not. I'm gonna leave y'all on this one here, y'all. A GOP-led Pennsylvania school board uh, voted to give the outgoing superintendent, uh, who's retiring, 
$700,000 severance package after the Republicans lost five seats on the school board. Central Buck School District Superintendent Abram Lukabal signed a five-year contract in July. He resigned Monday. The Republican-controlled board uh, holds the power until December 6, allowing board members to pass the controversial severance package six to three. At the school board meeting, hundreds of residents packed into an auditorium and protested at the severance, including $39,000 in taxes taxpayers must cover. It was approved. Now, I, now how in the hell? So the, so the deal here, Rebecca, so he don't want to serve under the Democrats. So he's like, yo, I'm out. Got it in July, and they gonna let his ass walk with 700000 Oh, hell no. I ain't paying nothing. I ain't paying nothing. I would rather pay the lawyers for him to sue us and to give him 700 grand because he don't want to work under a Democratic uh, board. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that's going to stand. Um, I definitely hope that folks challenge that. I don't see even with that vote, if they take that to court, I don't think that's going to stand. Like unless he had a guaranteed contract, but I mean this is not the NBA where you have like a guaranteed contract of if you get injured or something happens or you um, become a free agent, they cut you, whatever. Like, I, come on now, seven hundred fifty thousand. Crazy, Joy. Tell him we'll see you in court. Let him go to court with that. I'm with you. He won't get a dime. I'm with Rebecca. This is not going to stand. And if it does, let a court say it. This guy is is a grifter. He's running a scam. It's ridiculous. Yo, I, I, I'm telling you. Uh, but I'll be like, yeah, player, you ain't getting no money whatsoever. You ain't getting no money whatsoever. All right, y'all. Uh, that's it for us. Uh, we got the bounce. It's been an absolute uh, crazy week. These Republicans gonna, y'all know I don't drink, but these Republicans gonna make a brother drink because they the outside they mind. Robert, thanks a bunch. Uh, Joy, thanks a bunch. Rebecca, thanks a bunch. Uh, Rebecca, y'all came through the party last night, drank up all the liquor. Uh, and so <laughs> and Rebecca just drank up all the brown liquor. Uh, just all the brown liquor. She ain't want no clear liquor. She like, all I want, she said, she said, give me a clear glass, but the liquor better be brown. Uh, it was straight club brown liquor up in here. I'm surprised we still got half a bottle uh, of uh, whatever this Basil Hayden Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. I'm shocked. But uh, <laughs> let me thank <laughs> let me thank everybody who came out. Let me thank all of y'all uh, who gave me birthday shout outs on social media. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, let me thank, of course, our staff. Uh, we had a great time uh, with the party. Lynette, our cater. Lindsay, who handled uh, booking, the, uh, booking the bartender. Everything was fantastic. Uh, say what? I know Cynthia was the bartender. I said, let me thank Lindsay for hiring the bartender. K K Carol, don't be interrupting me while I'm in the middle of a dog going thanking everybody. Sit, sit in here. Damn, see? I'm trying to sit here and go through and she interrupted uh, Cynthia the bartender. I know who Cynthia was. All right. Uh, so, uh, again, let me thank Lindsay for booking Cynthia the bartender. Uh, had a good time. Folk came out. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, Congressman, Congressman Bobby Scott, my man, Congressman uh, Andre Carson, uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn, his daughter Mignon Clyburn, uh, so many others. My man John Hope Bryan and his wife Chaitra, they flew in from Atlanta. I appreciate that. Uh, it was so many different folks. Folks, uh, and I appreciate uh, all the uh, 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 the uh, the bites uh, from family members. I think we got two more: my nephew Chris, as well as uh, my brother and his wife. Uh, Y'all got those, right? You play them, including Chris. Yeah, just checking. All right, you know, Carol falling asleep in there because she also has some brown liquor uh, we've had now. So, all right, y'all, that's it. I'm going to see y'all tomorrow right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We're going to have a good time uh, tomorrow. I might bring the panel in tomorrow. Who's on the panel tomorrow? All right, uh, so see if they can come into the studio tomorrow. So, all right, y'all, that's it. 
I uh, hope y'all have a great time. Uh, let me also shout out uh, Adina Howard. Her birthday was yesterday. Let me see some other people. We shared birthdays today. Uh, my girl, um, let's see here. Uh, Adina's birthday was yesterday. Uh, Angel's birthday was yesterday. Uh, Bianca. Uh, Akosia's birthday was yesterday. Uh, Carlia's birthday was yesterday. I know a whole bunch of 1114 folk uh, whose birthday was yesterday. Uh, and so I think Carlia's and Rice's birthday is on the 14th as well. Uh, so let me thank everybody as well. So again, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Don't forget to support us in what we do. Uh, that is join our Brina Funk fan club. See your check in money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C. 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered Zale. Rolling at RolandSMartin.com. Rolling at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Don't forget you can watch us on, uh, 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 of course, uh, on Amazon News. But go to Amazon Fire, check us out there. Tell Alexa, play news from Black Star Network. Plex TV, Amazon Freebie. And Amazon Prime Video. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear. How the Browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. Folks, that's it. I'll see y'all tomorrow, folks. Right here. Same channel, same bat channel, same bat place. On for all the Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Ha! Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real um, revolutionary right now. Like, wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Thank <laughs> you.